Okay, uh, good afternoon. So uh, we live in uncertain times. Um, we uh, are more uncertain than usual. Uncertainty is built into the life of an entrepreneur and built into business, and it's a good thing to, to learn and thrive from. But uh, with Brexit and uh, the arrival of President Trump on the cards, I think people are maybe um, a little more uncertain than usual about um, some things we particularly maybe thought in the past were just to be taken for granted. So we're going to look at how uh, the tech sector and how entrepreneurs can adapt to that. And uh, to discuss that, uh, we have Ed Vasey, MP and uh, former Minister of State for Digital and Culture. Wendy Jeffson, uh, Chief Behavioral Scientist at Cybernetics. And uh, Christoph uh, Riecher. Correct. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> There's always someone on every panel I do where I have to check the pronunciation. Uh, for some reason, uh, it's there to test me. Um, uh, CEO of iWalker. So, um, welcome to you all. Uh, so, Wendy, um, you're chief behavioral scientist, and uh, you uh, look into uh, the behavior of uh, fund managers, and uh, you, you have a lot of insights into um, how uh, they're reacting to, to Brexit. Um, could you maybe give us a bit of insight into your observations? Yeah, so uh, we, we're, so we're fintech um, and we're doing behavioral analytics, so looking at the performance of the fund managers themselves to provide support to make better investment decisions and also to compliance, so to monitor them in a smarter way. Um, and fund managers and the financial industry are used to uncertainty and looking to predict what's going on in the markets in the future. So that's not new for them. That is their day job. Um, what we hear as we go through the organizations is that they, their planning is in place to um, look ahead for Brexit. We've been very um, lucky, I think, in having the FCA as a real leader in the field for regulation who have come out really early on to say clearly nothing's changing. You're still going to have to comply with the legislation coming, MARA and MIFID II. Um, the way we're looking at it collaboratively, keep engaging with us. Um, I was in Washington two weeks ago and Actually, there was the first panel, the first afternoon of panels was a load of Brits talking about Brexit and still talking about being ahead of the, of the field. So, actually, I think largely the financial um, community is geared up well, but they are looking to government to provide guidance on what's happening with passporting, what's happening with this, what are they going to tell their staff, the European staff? Are they going to stay? Are they, is it okay for them to stay? Because they need to plan ahead and um, make, just make provisions for that. Yeah, Christoph, um, uh, you, your company is uh, uh, based here, but is a Europe, has a lot of European investment. Is that right? Yep. And um, uh, what, how are you feeling about Brexit? It's bloody hard to build a business in the first place. <laughs> it's a real struggle to get out of bed, you know, in the very beginning to build it, um, and make it and make it a success. It's really, really, really difficult. And then you get all of these things all of a sudden thrown sort of in your way. Brexit, um, Trump now, and um, these are just, you know, a lot of additional complexities that all of a sudden sort of um, you have to deal with and navigate. So in, in our case, as we um, have to raise quite a bit of funding um, to be able to provide capital to our customers, the um, obvious one is uh, raising funding from, from investors. And um, as all of you here know, um, that's a lot more difficult in markets. They're very uncertain. Now, we have been successful in closing our CRC round after Brexit, um, but that would be the first one that would come to my mind and, and really adding a lot of complexity in the very short term for a lot of companies in the, in the tech world. Okay. And, um, uh Ed, uh, we hear a lot from people saying that um, uh, certainty is needed um, uh, for uh, businesses, but then we hear the government say, well, um, we can't give any certainty because we can't show our hand with negotiations. Um, and uh, so that, that's a, uh, uh, is there a resolution to that? How, how do we deal with that? Uh, I don't think there is a resolution to it, except if you <coughs> unpack what uh, people, I think, voted for. And I think you could say there will be uh, three areas where the government needs to bring clarity. One is uh, obviously what European laws are going to remain in place after we leave. And I think uh, in a sense you can see what they're going to do, which is to adopt all the existing European laws as they stand. And then moving forward, we'll have more of a piecemeal approach perhaps. But I hope in the future as well, we'll still be working with our partners in Europe because it makes sense to have a regulatory environment in the UK that slots in with Europe. Secondly, I think the biggest issue by far is uh, movement of people. 
So many tech companies rely on talent from all over Europe, and I think the government needs to provide clarity about that, but I understand their position, that they want to know what the position will be for British citizens living in Europe. And I think in particularly on the free movement, uh, they should, we need to address the issue about families. So many people who come from Europe to work in the UK say the huge bonus is that my partner or spouse can also work as well. Uh, we don't need to apply separately, as it were. We can come and work here for free. And then the third issue is clearly trade. Uh, where we have, I hope, an opportunity to strike some trade deals, but clearly that is not going to happen overnight, except with Donald Trump, with whom we're going to strike a trade deal probably on January the 21st. <laughs> Was that a, uh, a sarcastic comment there? Well, I mean, I think it's, <clears throat> it's a perverse thing, this tr the, the Trump election is so sort of discombobulating for so many people, but I'm a perennial optimist, and there are some bizarre, I think, benefits that we can get from a Trump presidency. First of all, in terms of unnerving world markets, I think the Trump election is a much bigger deal than Brexit, at least in the short term. Secondly, I think you're going to have a Republican administration and a Senate and a House that is, as it were, as skeptical, if you like, about the European Union as uh, the British government now has to be. So it won't necessarily put Britain solely in the bad person box and Europe in the good person box. And thirdly, I think in terms of maintaining a good relationship with our European partners, I think hopefully people will see the UK as a very useful ally in terms of translating European concerns to the American administration, particularly on issues like security and also obviously on free trade, where Britain is actually a great pioneer in free trade. So there's a great opportunity, I think, for the UK to take a leadership role, which to a certain extent people felt it had lost after Brexit. Although Trump is very um, against a lot of the uh, free trade agreements that exist, um, uh, you know, NAFTA and the like, and so um, it may be that uh, they have a period of uncertainty around that as well. And uh, yeah, it seems like a moving target, doesn't it, this whole thing? Well, there's a huge degree of uncertainty, and of course, you know, that uncertainty may be added to next year. We've got the French election, and we've also got the German election, and nobody knows now. Nobody can possibly now claim to be a soothsayer and predict any, the outcome of any uh, election coming up. So I think we've got to be prepared as well for uncertainty in the two major economies in the European Union as well. Wendy, how are you feeling about uh, tech and Trump? Tech and Trump? Um, I think I'd, everyone talks about uncertainty, but actually if you kind of look back, and I think about when I first started work, and I was originally a lawyer, and you went to work, you, there was no working from home, there was no technology, you, you couldn't wear trousers, you know, it, things have changed enormously. So actually uncertainty and change is the norm. And I think there's a huge opportunity for, in all of these changes, because our behavioral science, our natural status quo bias means that we don't like change and it's being forced upon us with Trump and with Brexit. And actually, I think, as you've already said, there's a huge opportunity in that because people don't do things until they have to. And now they have to, and they have to look at it differently. They, so we're in the world of the entrepreneurs. I think the government is in the world of the entrepreneur doing something different that it has to. The difference is, of course, they're being watched by the world as they do it, and everybody's got an opinion. Um, but I think that's, that's actually how you get, and this country has got a huge you know, source of innovation to come up with great solutions to the problems that they've got to now face, they've got to now tackle. So I kind of look at it as, yeah, we've got, there's a lot of uncertainty. There always has been. We've always come up with some great ideas. This, this whole conference is about new ideas to solve problems. And we're just being pushed a bit faster and a bit harder than maybe we would have done in, you know, if this hadn't happened. So for me, Trump is shaking up some, some core values that um, I think most of the people here in this room um, are going to share about equality, about um, giving chances um, to people, including um, immigrants. And you know, coming back a bit to, to Brexit and the UK, there has been um, uncertainty that isn't necessary. For example, the two million people from the European Union that are living here in the UK, they should be granted um, the confirmation of being able, able to stay here, uh, whatever will happen, they should not be taken by the government or other European governments as sort of a, um, a little piece of the puzzle that you might be able to trade um, against. 
And I think if I look at Trump and the language that he used, and some of the language that, frankly, you know, we have heard here in, um, in, the, in the UK, and not just from, from Nigel Farage or UKIP, but also some of the more, much more mainstream parties, um, I think that would be a clear sign to the tech scene, but generally to the world, that we kind of make a good step forward in showing Trump and everyone else in the world that uh, we do care about the people who um, work here and have contributed massively to the success of the company, to the country over the, the past years. And I think that uncertainty is really entirely in the hand of, um, of government to do something about that. Ed? Well, I mean, I have, a lot, I have a lot of sympathy for your view, but I also understand what the British government wants to do in terms of uh, holding its cars close to its chest. But I mean, obviously, I represent a constituency with a lot of Europeans who live and work there because it's got a lot of science, a lot of high tech. Uh, and I completely understand the frustration uh, that European citizens living in the UK feel about having certainty. And uh, I know it has an impact on business. I know it has an impact in terms of people being offered positions who take a view, actually, it's not worth, it's too risky to take that position because I don't know what my position might be in two years' time. So I think in an ideal world, we would, uh, in an ecumenical way, grant uh, European residents already living here um, permission you know, to stay indefinite leaves remain, however you want to call it. But the government is not going to do that. The government is going to hold back until Article 50 is triggered and uh, negotiations begin so that it can be certain that uh, the millions of Brits who live, for example, in Spain can also get reciprocal rights. Do you think that um, uh, obviously there was controversy around um, uh, Nissan getting uh, assurances that, that meant they would uh, continue to invest in, in Sunderland? Um, do you think that um, the, there's going to be a chance for more of these uh, kinds of private assurances to, to keep uh, some of the bigger businesses in the country? Well, I think, yeah, the government's going to have to work very hard. You know, the Nissan situation was a very unfortunate situation to be in. It was caused, uh, you know, explicitly by... Brexit, I think it would have been a no-brainer, obviously, for Nissan to announce it was making the cash guy. If Brexit hadn't happened, that would have just been an automatic decision, and the government had to work very hard to persuade Nissan to stay, and you can understand why it did so, because if Nissan had suddenly announced it wasn't going to continue its investment, I think it would have had a catastrophic effect on economic uh, confidence. So I'm sure the government will want to keep its door open to big inward investors, but at the same time, uh, there is an opportunity, particularly in tech. You know, I think uh, a lot of the UK's strengths are not going to go away regardless of Brexit. We're not going to go away in terms of our, the flexibility of our labour market. We're not going to disappear in terms of the ecosystem that exists, particularly in London, but also in cities like Manchester as well, and the kind of expertise. You know, talking to some of the companies involved in a sector like AI and the, you know, the strength and depth in a company like DeepMind, even though it's effectively now... Uh, partnering with Google, but you've still got a concentration of expertise based in London that is going to have an effect in terms of that sector being uh, UK-based and companies coming here to grow. And obviously, I read today that California is now potentially going to seek independence because of the <laughs> Trump presidency, but who knows whether we might get uh, more West Coast investment in the UK because we are a tech-friendly nation and tech companies who might feel discombobulated by the Trump presidency might continue to look at the UK as a good place to put some of their operations. So I think it's important from my narrow perspective, having been the digital economy minister, that the government works particularly hard to show the tech community that the UK remains very much open for business and a good place to invest. Okay, we've talked a lot about um, kind of assuring certainty, and uh, I mean, uh, certainty is quite a, a broad thing uh, and quite a, uh, quite a <laughs> hard thing to define. But um, Wendy, uh, looking at your own business, um, what are your business's particular concerns around uh, Brexit and uh, Trump and the, 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 chain, the big shifts we're seeing uh, kind of socially and economically and politically? I think, I mean, from our business, we are fintech, fintech's global. And actually, as you say, Ed, if um, the West Coast is getting a bit disconcerted, actually for us, you know, fintech is here, it's in London, and it's in one place. And actually, that's an enormous advantage. So if you've got East Coast, West Coast fintech, actually, in the US, they're not joined up and they're being disrupted by Trump, that is a huge opportunity for London to really 
keep moving even further ahead on the fintech scene. And again, the FCA, because of the fintech bridges, um, collaborating with other regulatory authorities around the world, particularly Singapore and Mass and Hong Kong, which are really innovative and fast moving, and also ASIC in Australia, because we've been introduced into Australia without even trying to ASIC because of the FCA. So actually, in that sense, we're not being affected and our, our clients are global. So we, we contact them in London and then we're automatically exported around the world. So I think luckily, that's, that's a good thing. And as Ed points out there, actually, I think there's, there's some real advantages potentially coming our way. Any thoughts, Christoph? Have we cheered you up, Christoph? I haven't followed. <laughs> I haven't followed sort of terms with Oric specifically, sort of um, related to fintech. Um, and my understanding would be that probably that's not sort of uh, been a big topic that he would have shared with it's most part of the of voters. It's part of the cyber. It's part of the cyber that he's, that he's addressing. <laughs> but generally speaking, he's um, trying to deregulate the system further, um, or again, and um, he's lowering taxes. So we will see how this will play out in the U.S. economy. Um, but I think you can see it from, from, from both sides that um, maybe some industries will benefit from that. And given that the, one of the most regulated industries is the financial services, and particularly sort of after the Great Recession, maybe he will turn back some of this, um, which um, might, be, might be positive for some. Yeah, there's this uh, lot of panic from a lot of uh, very smart people around Trump uh, before he was elected. A lot of people saying, don't, don't, don't vote Trump. And now he's been elected. A lot of those people seem to be saying, I think he'll be okay. I think it'll be fine. Um, let's give him a chance. And you can see why they do that to an extent, because this is the, the head of state as well as the political leader. This is somebody that democratically and constitutionally has to be respected. But um, is he, a real, is he a, a real risk? Is he a real loose cannon? Or do you think it'll, it'll all be okay? Well, I think any of his language is a completely loose um, cannon. And I can only be optimistic and... Um, you know, think that he didn't mean the things that he said literally, but rather uh, metaphorically. Um, and in that case, I think what he said will be significantly reduced already by his own sort of things that he wants to achieve. But it will certainly also be um, dialed back quite significantly by Congress and Senate, which is both now in, in the Republicans' um, hands. So, you know, more stuff um, will be able to, um, to get done. But it's a shame that a lot of good things that happened over the last eight years in the US, a lot of sort of big sort of things that, that were implemented um, from, from Iran or you know, Obamacare, um, you know, they are likely going to be um, unwound. And it just looks that the last eight years will you know, go in history a bit as a lost decade for, for, the, for the US. And it's quite unclear you know, what the next sort of um, few years will, will bring um, as an alternative. Yeah. Ed, thoughts on Trump? Well, I mean, as I said earlier, I'm an optimist, and uh, uh, it's, I think it's a natural human emotion when something like this happens that you were perhaps uh, expecting to try and see uh, what the good points will be. And uh, I agree with Christoph that I'm very much hoping the rhetoric that happened during the election campaign is very far removed from the reality of what a Trump administration will be like. Uh, you might find uh, the US government is able to do more things more effectively. Now the House uh, and the presidency are aligned in the same party. I'm, not an, I'm more on the liberal wing of the Conservative Party than I am on the right wing, so some of the, the stuff they want to do might not be things that I support. But in he headline terms, Trump's uh, emphasis on, for example, on infrastructure and his emphasis uh, on uh, lowering business taxes could be a very good thing, and in, a lot of people are talking about the amount, of, the huge amount of capital that is kept offshore in the U.S. because of uh, tax rates might be incentivized to come back onshore and actually contribute to investment in the U.S. economy. There are other complicated, uh, kind of very tech-specific issues which Trump has opined on, things like net neutrality, where Europe has a very, I think, a different position actually to the U.S. on issues like net neutrality, which could become uh, a focal point, but in terms of potentially having a business-friendly president who is able to do business with Congress, if you strip away the extraordinary nature of this campaign and the extraordinary remarks that have been uh, have emerged during the campaign, you can grab on to quite an optimistic uh, narrative. Wendy, are you optimistic? 
I am, I am optimistic, but I actually think um, rather than say, oh, I, perhaps he didn't mean it, I think he absolutely meant it, what he says. And that's, that's not a bad thing to hear somebody who hasn't been trained to kind of containerize and, and smooth out these things because you really get what he's thinking. And actually, you're, you're, in, a, you're in a much um, better place, actually, if you know exactly what your opposition or whatever it is is really, really thinking and what they're like and how they come at something because then you've got the whole picture to go in and go into battle with them. So I actually think he, he actually believes an awful lot of what he said. And I, I, a lot of people don't say what they really think. So yes, there'll be people around, but again, I was talking to somebody in Washington who's worked in the White House and the president does have a huge amount of power and can surround him by people who can get stuff done. So that's quite scary. Um, but the more he keeps speaking out, the more people can hear what he's really saying and they can challenge it. And he will come, he will come at it from a different angle, com coming from business, not a career politician. So you will have different views, which is a good thing, because it makes people think differently. And if he keeps expressing himself freely, everybody will get a true measure of who he is and what he's about. And they will either, you know, they'll come out and fight if they disagree with it strongly. It's quite hard to fight with somebody who's gives you a smooth political line. Yeah. <laughs> I've never had a fight in politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you actually mentioned something, Ed, you mentioned something earlier uh, about um, uh, repatriating cash. Um, uh, if, if that happens, if let's say Apple has lots of offshore cash, there's right, oh, now it's tax efficient for us to bring it back. That could actually be a problem for acquisitions uh, in the, um, in the uh, European market where um, maybe these uh, big, uh, companies from Silicon Valley might think, well, we won't acquire as many companies in Europe. Christoph, do you think? Um, <clears throat> I mean, if it's a tax amnesty, then I guess, um, you know, I don't, I don't expect the capital market will be restricted between um, the UK and the US. So I think capital will continue to flow freely. So I would expect that the tax can go out of the US again to sort of do, do our um, acquisition. I wouldn't expect that to have a, a big impact. Um, but I think, you know, coming back to the point on, on, on Trump and, and, and technology, I think, you know, you can see in the technology sector how people um, are united and how he actually achieved to unite a very, very large part of the population in um, trying to do things better, which probably would have faded much more under, under, under Hillary Clinton. I think now sort of with him every day being reminded by the things that he might be saying, that you, know, you have to fight sort of against some of this rhetoric and um, it hopefully might um, you know, create bridges sort of through some of the divisions that have been created over the last few years, not just in the US but also here in the UK. I think there's awareness that we have a much bigger problem than Trump um, or Clinton, but it really starts in, in our communities and in our companies, not so much ours of course, but you know, others eventually. Um, I think that sort of also gives everyone some, some strength and, um, you know, maybe he is sort of this, this uh, mirror that, you know, we needed um, to really wake up and, um, and see where things have gone wrong in the last sort of 10, 20, 20 years that slowly kind of have um, come up. Because it's quite unprecedented in the time that I live that you had um, such a division between generations, older people and younger people between people with more and less education that really kind of we as the losing party on this um, seem to have to address because otherwise they're not, going, they're not going away. And I think the tech industry in particular is very, very strong position to take a leading role in, in this. And I would hope that, um, that we will. Fantastic. And of course, whoever's in power, tech is still going to become everything. Tech is going to transform the entire world, whatever happens. So, uh, yes, absolutely. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, all three of you. That's been a really fascinating chat. And uh, I'd like to just thank Donald Trump for giving us something else interesting to get our teeth into there, at least. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to Ed, Wendy, and Christoph. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much.